Hi, this is Tom from ZeroToFinals.com. In this video, I'm going to be going through supraventricular tachycardia. And you can find written notes on this topic at ZeroToFinals.com slash learn or in the cardiology section of the Zero to Finals medicine book. I want to start by saying this video is designed to help your understanding of SVT in preparation for exams and not to guide your clinical practice. Always check the national and local guidelines and consult experienced seniors when you're treating patients. So let's jump straight in. Supraventricular tachycardia refers to a fast heart rate, which is called tachycardia, that's caused by abnormal electrical signals that come from above, which is what supra refers to, the ventricles. And this means it essentially comes from the atria. Let's start by talking about the pathophysiology. In normal circumstances, the electrical signals of the heart start in the sinoatrial node, and this is located at the junction between the superior vena cava and the right atrium. The electrical signals then travel through the right and the left atrium, causing an atrial contraction. Then it travels through the atrioventricular node and down to the ventricles where it causes a ventricular contraction. Normally the electrical signal in the heart can only go in one direction, from the atria to the ventricles. Normally electricity cannot pass from the ventricles back into the atria. In most cases of supraventricular tachycardia, it's caused by the electrical signal re-entering the atria from the ventricles. Once the signal is back in the atria, it travels back through the AV node to the ventricles again and causes another ventricular contraction. This causes a self-perpetuating electrical loop without an endpoint and results in a fast, narrow complex tachycardia. Paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, or paroxysmal SVT, describes a situation where the SVT reoccurs and remits in the same patient over time in between which there are periods of normal sinus rhythm. Let's talk about narrow complex tachycardia. SVT typically causes a narrow complex tachycardia, meaning the duration of the QRS complex is less than 0.12 seconds. On a normal 25 mm per second ECG, 0.12 seconds equates to three small squares. So the QRS complex in SVT will fit within three small squares. On an ECG, SVT looks like a QRS complex followed immediately by a T wave, then another QRS complex, and then a T wave, and so on. There are four main differentials of a narrow complex tachycardia. And these are sinus tachycardia, SVT, atrial fibrillation, and atrial flutter. There are key features that will help you differentiate between these different diagnoses. You should be able to spot sinus tachycardia on an ECG, as this will have the normal P wave, QRS, and T wave pattern. Sinus tachycardia is not an arrhythmia, and is usually a response to an underlying cause, such as sepsis or pain, and the mainstay of management is to treat the underlying cause. In supraventricular tachycardia, the QRS complexes are regular, which help you differentiate it from atrial fibrillation, where the QRS complexes will be irregularly irregular. In atrial flutter, the atrial rate is usually around 300 beats per minute, and it gives a sawtooth pattern on the ECG, with the QRS complex occurring at regular intervals depending on how often there is conduction from the atria to the ventricles. Usually this is two atrial contractions to one ventricular contraction, or two P waves to one QRS complex. Sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish between the different causes, so always seek help from an experienced person when you have any doubts. SVT can also cause a broad-based tachycardia if the patient also has a bundle branch block. I won't go into too much detail about this, but it's worth bearing in mind. For now, just remember that SVT causes a narrow complex tachycardia. So let's talk about the types of SVT. 
And there are three main types of SVT depending on the source of the electrical signal. Atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia is when the re-entry point is back through the AV node. So the electricity passes from the atria through the AV node into the ventricles and then back through the AV node into the atria again. Atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia is when the re-entry point is an accessory pathway. This refers to an additional electrical pathway somewhere between the atria and the ventricles that lets electricity back through. This is the most common type of SVT. Having an extra electrical pathway in the heart is called Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. This electrical pathway might not cause any symptoms or it might cause episodes of SVT. The extra electrical pathway may be seen on a routine ECG as a slurred upstroke in the QRS complex and this is called a delta wave. There will also be a short PR interval. This change on the ECG is caused by the electricity prematurely entering the ventricles through the accessory pathway. Finally, there's atrial tachycardia. And this is where the electrical signal originates in the atria somewhere other than the sinoatrial node. This is not caused by a signal re-entering from the ventricles, but instead from abnormally generated electrical activity in the atria. This ectopic electrical activity causes an atrial rate above 100 beats per minute. Let's talk about the acute management of stable patients with supraventricular tachycardia. When managing SVT in a stable patient, we take a stepwise approach, trying each step to see whether it works before moving on to the next one. The patient should be on continuous ECG monitoring so that you can monitor in real time the electrical activity of the heart. The first thing to try is the Valsalva maneuver. And this can be done by asking the patients to blow hard against resistance. For example, blowing into a plastic syringe. The next thing to try is carotid sinus massage and this involves massaging the carotid on one side gently with two fingers. Often these simple measures without using any medication will be enough to convert the patient back to sinus rhythm. If these measures don't work then the next step is adenosine and we're going to talk in more detail about that shortly. An alternative to adenosine is verapamil which is a calcium channel blocker and this is used where adenosine is contraindicated. Usually these measures will be successful. In rare cases where they fail, the patient may need electrical cardioversion. So let's talk in more detail about adenosine. Adenosine works by slowing cardiac conduction primarily through the atrioventricular node. It interrupts the AV node or accessory pathway during SVT and resets it back to sinus rhythm. The half-life of adenosine is less than 10 seconds, meaning it's very quickly metabolised and stops having an effect. It needs to be given as a rapid bolus so that it reaches the heart quickly and with enough impact to interrupt the pathway for a short period. It will often cause a brief period of asystole or bradycardia that can be scary for both the patient and the doctor, however it's very quickly metabolised and then normal sinus rhythm should return. There's a few key points on administering adenosine. It needs to be avoided if the patient has asthma, COPD, heart failure, heart block or severe hypotension. It's important to warn the patient about the scary feeling of dying or impending doom that will happen when the adenosine is injected, although this is only short-lived and the patient will feel back to normal as soon as the effects wear off. It needs to be given as a fast intravenous bolus into a large proximal cannula, for example a grey cannula in the anticubital fossa. And as soon as it's been injected, the cannula needs to be flushed fast in order to push the medication as quickly as possible to the heart where it needs to take action. The doses are initially 6 milligrams, then 12 milligrams, and then a further 12 milligrams if no improvement occurs between the doses. Next let's talk about management in unstable patients. When we talk about unstable patients, we mean patients that have been compromised by supraventricular tachycardia. 
And these are patients who've got a raised respiratory rate, chest pain, hypotension, signs of heart failure or poor perfusion. Treating unstable patients with SVT involves using synchronised cardioversion with a defibrillator, usually done under sedation or general anaesthetic. Synchronised cardioversion means the defibrillator monitors the electrical signals of the heart, particularly trying to identify the R waves. An electric shock is synchronised with the ventricular contraction so that the shock occurs at the correct time. The shock will occur at the R wave on the ECG and if successful it will be followed by sinus rhythm. The reason synchronised cardioversion is used in patients that still have a pulse is that we need to avoid shocking the patient during a T wave. If you deliver a shock during a T wave it can cause ventricular fibrillation and send the patient into cardiac arrest. Unstable patients may also require amiodarone to help with restoring the normal electrical activity. Let's talk about long-term management of patients with paroxysmal SVT. When patients develop recurrent episodes of SVT, then measures can be taken to prevent these episodes from occurring. And the options for this are medications such as beta blockers, calcium channel blockers or amiodarone, and radiofrequency ablation. Let's talk in more detail about radiofrequency ablation. Catheter ablation is performed in an electrophysiology laboratory, often called a cath lab. It involves a local or general anaesthetic, inserting a catheter into the femoral vein and feeding a wire through the venous system under x-ray guidance up to the heart. Once the wire is in the heart, it's placed against different areas to test the electrical signals in that area. This way the operator can hopefully find the location of any abnormal electrical pathways. The operator may try and induce the arrhythmia in order to make the abnormal pathways easier to find. Once the abnormal pathway is identified, radiofrequency ablation, which is essentially heat, is applied to burn the abnormal area of electrical activity. This leaves scar tissue that does not conduct electrical activity and the aim is to remove the accessory pathway that's causing the arrhythmia. Radiofrequency ablation can be curative for certain types of arrhythmia caused by abnormal electrical pathways, and these can include supraventricular tachycardias, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, atrial flutter, and atrial fibrillation. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked the video, left a comment or subscribe to the channel, thank you so much, it really helps. Zero to Finals is not just a YouTube channel, there's also a website with detailed notes, illustrations and questions, an Instagram account where new questions are posted every day to help you test your knowledge, books, flashcards and much more. I also have a personal channel where I share my thoughts and tips on learning medicine, and you can find links to everything in the description of this video. See you next time.